If you're new and just joining us for the first time, we're in the midst of a series on Psalms, and the aim of this series is to help us to understand how God's Word, and in particular the Psalms, meet us in uh, our emotional life and help us to have a healthy, uniquely Christian, robust emotional life. That is, our emotions as Christians should be affected by God's Word and by the Gospel. We often think about uh, this in terms of, <clears throat> well, I, I know differently and I believe differently and I act differently, but the whole person has been affected by the fall and by sin. The whole person, the, the mind, the will, the actions, and the emotions. And what often happens is we talk a lot about the mind and we talk a lot about the will and we talk a lot about the actions, but we tend to neglect the redemptive work of the gospel in terms of our emotional life and how we feel and how we react and, and the emotions that go on within us, though they are complex, are redeemed by the gospel of grace because God is making us totally new. He is conforming us completely to the image of Christ, and that includes our emotions. And as we think about this, another aim of this has been we're preaching through some psalms that we are singing. So last week I preached through Psalm 34. We sang Psalm 34 this morning. We preached through Psalm 51 and we sang Psalm 51 this morning. And uh, our psalm of the month is Psalm 25, which we'll be coming to next week. And so we'll be singing that at the psalm sing and invite you to come and join us in that. But the aim of that is that we might not just sing the, the words, but actually have an understanding of what's going on in that psalm as we sing, that, that singing the psalm might actually impact and affect our emotional life as well. But this morning, we're turning to Psalm 27. And as I thought about this psalm, there are really two heart postures that we can adopt as human beings. Uh, this, is a, this is broad, right? This is like zooming out to the 30,000-foot flyover picture. Uh, but there are really two heart postures that we can take, one of fear or one of faith. Um, oftentimes, we couch it in trust and mistrust, but faith and fear are really opposed to one another in a very significant way. We often experience fear, and it's understandable that we should experience fear. We have fear of circumstances. We have fear of unknowns. We can have fear from relational dynamics. We can have fear from uh, our health condition. And, and a lot of times when we think about fear, uh, I've thought a lot about fear. My dad was in the army. I was in the army. Fear is kind of like one of those, like my dad would always tell you, you got to overcome your fear. You got to face your fear and overcome your fear. Uh, and that's what courage is. Well, th I don't think so. Um, I, I think that that's well intended, but courage is really doing the right thing in spite of being afraid. And oftentimes our fear arises from this mind game that we play of the what if. What, what if this happens? What if it turns out that way? So think about this, for example. You, get, you go to the doctor, they run some tests, and there's, there's, you haven't gotten any results yet. But, but what do you do? You go home and you start playing the, the what if game. Your mind starts going crazy. You start thinking, well, what if it's this? Oh, well, what if it's this? I wonder if I only have this long to live, then what if this and what if this? And, and that fear takes root and takes hold in these areas of unknown or in these areas of um, circumstance. And we, we oftentimes feed that with how we think. And now there's a difference between a wise measuring of choices and then being paralyzed by fear. So I want to be clear about that. But what oftentimes ends up missing when we're captivated and controlled by fear is a lack of faith, practical faith. Like, I'm not talking about the intellectual ascent. I'm not talking about the generic, oh, yeah, I believe that. I'm talking about like the, the real, deep, personalized, rooted in our own heart and soul type of faith in this God who oversees all the affairs of my life, including everything that I will face. God provides, God protects, God directs, God cares. God, and, and, and 
a, a hindrance to this is oftentimes the, the common cultural Christianese phrases that we get, that God won't give you more than you can handle. Right, that's the right response to that, right? That's, we should laugh at that. That's ridiculous. Like, I can't, I can't handle, like, my, my frailty as a broken human being is so expansive that I get, I get bent out of shape when my kids spill milk sometimes. That is the, I can't even handle that at times, right? So, so God doesn't give me more than I can handle. My kids spilled milk and I reacted like a jerk. That, that's telling me something about what I can handle. That's not true. He does give us more than we can handle by design. Um, another one is God saves his most difficult situations for his strongest saints. That's not true either. Right? And, and, and it comes from a lack of understanding of, of suffering and the role of suffering and the role of difficulty and how God uses it in a redemptive way in our own hearts. But the point is that all of those sayings, though biblically unsound and practically not true, are meant to quell and comfort this fear that we often face. It's meant to set us at ease emotionally. And, and what ends up happening is it takes us away from where we should go, which is to this deeply rooted individual, personal, heart, soul, penetrating faith in God that has practical application in these situations in our lives and changes our focus and our attention to me in a very subtle way. Think about that. God doesn't give you more than you can handle. So therefore, buck up. It's on you. Right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Press into it. Overcome it. Mind over matter. He gave it to you. He knows you can handle it. It's on you. He saves his most difficult situations for his strongest saints. And then when we struggle, we're like, oh my gosh, what am I? I'm supposed to be, I, f I should be one of the strongest ones. And we see other people that are are dealing with stuff that's way beyond what we're dealing with, and they seem to be handling it with this grace and this fortitude and this resilience and this emotional uh, anti-fragility that we want. And then we're like, wait, what? what's going on here? We will either live by fear or faith. And the psalmist in Psalm 27 this morning has enemies all around him, and he has lots of reasons to be afraid. But he is living by faith, and in doing so, he is calling us to be emotionally healthy Christians who don't give way to fear, but live by faith. It's the word of the Lord from Psalm 27. Of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers assail me, to eat up my flesh, my adversities and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp around me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have arisen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word the Lord has for us this morning, and it is eternally true.
I want to work through this in three different movements. Uh, the first one can be labeled confidence in God. So we, we struggle with fear. We have moments when we are afraid. We have long periods of time where we might be afraid. And what's, what's really fascinating is the number of times in Scripture that we're told not to be afraid. Okay, so just think with me for a second on this. If God tells us not to be afraid and we find ourselves afraid, then that means what? Like, work through this with me. That means that we are in disobedience to the clear command of God, and therefore, all disobedience in some way is tied back to a lack of faith, right? Now, there, there are some people that would push back and be like, whoa, 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 you're saying all fear is sinful? And I'm saying yes, because God says don't be afraid. And, and that should weigh on us because it should reveal the depths of how much sin has impacted us and how, as we'll see in this psalm, faith is not just some abstract thing. It's something that has to be appropriated in our lives, in our hearts, every single moment. But it also should magnify how God loves and forgives us because even when we do fail, he has provided a way for us to be right with him. So if we are going to respond rightly when we are tempted to be afraid, if we are going to have a robust and resilient emotional life, the first thing from this psalm that we see is it begins with a confidence in God. Verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me and eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though wars arise against me, yet I shall be confident. Do you see the connection there? I will not fear. I will be confident. If we are to have a sort of fearless living as Christians, a fearless emotional life as Christians, it's directly proportional to our confidence in God. Low confidence in God will result in high fear. High confidence in God, conversely, will result in lower fear. Right? There's an inverse relationship between these two. Fear comes from vulnerability and weakness. Fear comes from unknowns and uncertainty. For example, we can be afraid of the dark. Why, can, why are people afraid of the dark? Because they're unable to see. See, fear is a response of limited and frail beings. Beings who are not omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. In other words, fear is a response from people who are not God. It, it evidences our weakness and our vulnerability because we fear what we don't know. We fear uncertainty. We, we fear not knowing what, are, what is around us. We fear unperceived danger around us. We fear imaginary danger that could be there, possibly, maybe, in the future. Why? Because we don't know. Because there is uncertainty. Uncertainty will always produce fear. Now, we are uncertain of all sorts of things around us because they live in this realm of the ashes of Eden, too. There are all sorts of variables we can't control, all sorts of things we cannot influence and impact around us, and all sorts of things that we don't know. So there's a fear that comes from uncertainty But yet we can be certain in God. We can be confident in God because he does not change. Do you see how that works? Like we look around and we see uncertainty all around us and we get afraid. So what's the antidote to fear? Stop looking at the uncertain things and look at the certain thing. And, and grow in our certainty of God. Grow in our, another way to say it is grow in our confidence of God. In David's case, 
we see that he has enemies that are gathering all around him in, in verses 2 and 3. And the point that David is making is he doesn't know the immediate outcome, but he will not be afraid because of what he does know of the one who oversees and governs that outcome. And at the same time, he will be confident in the fact that the wicked and those who oppress God and his people will not be able to stand against God. What this means is that David is confident in God's power and care for his people. Though enemies may win a temporary battle, they will lose the war. Though the righteous may uh, have many who are standing against them, none of them will stand against the Lord, and God will uphold the righteous and keep them and work all things out together for their good. In other words, the power of God far surpasses the power of the most threatening enemy and the most powerful army. And when we think about it in that light, fear becomes rather silly, doesn't it? I said last week that wrong fear needs to be replaced with right fear. Last week in Psalm 34, uh, we saw this term, the fear of the Lord, show up multiple times. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who just can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. There is a natural tendency, in other words, to fear man, but Jesus is saying, that's the wrong fear. You need a different fear, a healthy fear, a right fear. One commentator said he urges his disciples not to respond to this persecution with misplaced fear. More specifically, he tells them to respond with proper fear. He tells them not to waste their concern on those in authority who cannot kill their, or who can only kill their bodies, but cannot kill their souls. Instead, they sh should reserve their fear for the one who can kill both the body and the soul. This is not intended to be an abject terror or panic. Rather, it is a healthy kind of fear which a soldier has for his weapon or a cook for the fire in a stove. Godly fear involves great profound respect, and at the same time, it does demand we acknowledge that God can utterly destroy those who are against him. This is a right and proper fear. So, um, as I was writing this at about 11 o'clock at night, kids were in bed, sitting in the living room, and the peace in our home was shattered by one of my children in the basement screaming. She had woken up to go potty, and as she was there, she looked on the floor, and there was a tiny spider, <laughs> which elicited this response of abject terror. It was a blood-curdling scream. And so, in her fear, she was calling out to me, now leave aside for a second whether or not that was uh, any threat, right? Leave aside whether or not that spider was any real threat to her for a moment. Think of how much effort it took me when I went down there to step on that spider and kill it. It was the easiest thing I did all day long. E by far the easiest thing I did all day long. In fact, I came down, she's terrified, screaming, I'm like, what, what's wrong? She's a spider! Little tiny little thing. I had no effort Boop, there, it's dead. And an immediate relief. Oh, oh, thank goodness. Did I have to put any effort forward to metaphorically deliver my daughter? No. Not. I was so superior to that spider, so much more power, so much more strength, that that spider did not stand a chance. And as for her part, whether or not she allowed fear to control her and overcome her should not have had anything to do with the size and threat of the spider, right? Think about that. Her fear should have had nothing to do with the threat or size of the spider, but with the ability of her father to handle it. You see that? Sometimes illustrations are just given at the right time. There's an interesting paradigm that repeatedly shows up in Scripture. When people are confronted by God or the glory of God, they respond in terror, and that is a right response for those who do that. And what we see over and over and over again is God saying, 
or the angel saying, when they have this healthy fear, don't be afraid. The point is that fear will often cause us to live in a way inconsistent with what is pleasing to God, in a way that robs him of glory or dishonors him because we are more afraid of other things, more preoccupied with temporal and transient things than we are with the God that transcends all of those things and is so superior to all of those things. How much fear in our lives comes from a lack of confidence in God and a lack of faith? Example, Jesus on the boat, right? Remember, the disciples are on the boat. Jesus is asleep. The storm comes up. They were afraid. Don't you care about us? For, for you with kids, uh, for those of you with children, the storm that stopped, great book. Love that book. And, and the, they're, they're afraid because of the storm. And Jesus stands up. And listen to what he says in Mark 440. Jesus said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And what does he do? He just speaks, peace, be still. And the storm obeys. And then they're terrified. Because God's in the boat with me. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Like, don't you believe? Don't you think I care for you? Don't you think I have the ability with just the simple words that were used to create this entire universe and that, that upholds everything by the word of my power? Don't you think I can just speak, put out no effort whatsoever, and deliver you from this fear that you have? It's an irrational fear at that point, right? Did you see how Jesus connects fear with lack of faith, though? In fact, Jesus has commanded us to not be afraid. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Isaiah 43, 1, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by my name, you are mine. Why are we commanded to not fear? And why is fear connected with a lack of faith? Because fear is the opposite of trust and a lack of confidence in God. And the psalmist is saying, I have confidence in God, therefore I will not fear. And if our confidence in God is to grow, our faith must grow, and our faith will only grow in proportion to the object of our faith, so we must have a bigger view of God. Not because the things that we are afraid of go away, but because we see more clearly the power of God, the sovereignty of God, the love of God for his children, and the fact that he is fiercely for us and more powerful than anyone or anything. This is what David is saying in verse 1. The Lord being his light means the knowledge of God comforts him in darkness. He is David's salvation, so he is safe in the midst of trouble. God is the stronghold of his life, so he knows he is secure, though troubles and enemies surround him. In other words, a safe place for David. And this safe place is God who will stand against David's enemies. In both cases, David asks, who shall I fear? The answer is no one. So what's the basis for fearlessness? First is confidence in the Lord. Secondly, we see a desire for God in verses 4 through 6. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon the rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above the enemies around me, and I will sacrifice in his tent or I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. So because of the stability that God provides and the fact that God is the light of his salvation and the stronghold of his life, David has an intense desire for God. He wants to be where God is and where his people are. This desire for God is one of the fundamental marks of the new birth. It is what Jonathan Edwards called religious affections. It is what Piper calls Christian hedonism. 
And what we see throughout Scripture is a thread that any kind of faith will always be accompanied by a longing for God, a desire for God, a love for God. What we don't see in Scripture is a paradigm wherein one can intellectually ascend to the truths of the gospel without the heart and the affections and the emotions being affected by that and changed, redirected. What is foreign to scripture is some kind of emotionless indifference to God while professing to know him and professing to having been changed by him. I've said it this way before. The essence of genuine saving faith is a treasuring and trusting of God in Christ that leads to joy, peace, and rest. Treasuring and trusting are essential for faith. Here in verses 4 through 6, we see a picture of what treasuring looks like and how it comes out. In verse 4, we see treasuring, and in verse 5, we see trusting. Verse 4, treasuring. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. That's treasuring. David starts with an intense longing to be with God. To experience his presence. The intensity and primacy of this is expressed in terms of a singular desire. So if I were to take you, and I were to, I were to say, listen, you can ask God one thing and he will give it to you. One thing. This is not meant to compare God to some kind of genie, but think about it for that moment. Right now, if you can ask God for one thing and you knew he would grant it, what would it be? Let me put it another way. Would it be something that was determined by your current circumstance or something that transcends it? If you're in pain, would it be for the pain to go away? If you're lonely and feeling grief over loss, would it be for that to go away? Would it be for your financial situation to change, for your family dynamic to change? Would it be for your dream job or health or success or a better marriage? One thing. I ask this because I believe how we answer this question gives a really good indicator not only of our hearts, but how we view God. Think of, think of your prayer life. Think of what you ask for on a regular basis when you pray. I'm not implying that we should not ask for these things. God wants us to bring our requests and our longings and our anxieties to him. He wants us to ask him for things. But remember the question, one thing. What's the one thing? If you could have one thing, what would it be? One single thing. And for David, the one thing he asks of the Lord is the same thing that guides his life. Look at what he says in verse 4. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after. Right, So he's not just asking God for it. He's orienting his entire life around this one thing. His one thing is driven by his deepest desire, which is to be present with God, to gaze upon his beauty, to learn from him. For David, this is what life is about. One commentator said, David here asserts that he finds no place more satisfying, no sight more gratifying, no information more edifying than what he experiences in Yahweh's presence. To behold or to gaze is not only to perceive, but also to enjoy. We are made to enjoy beauty, excellency, majesty. David's desire is to enjoy the whole character of God. And that lines, on, that lines up with the New Testament command to rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Find joy in God. We are made to know and enjoy God. What does the Westminster Catechism say? What is the chief end of man? To enjoy God or to uh, enjoy God or glorify God and enjoy him forever. Joy is not optional. In fact, there is no real lasting joy apart from God. And to enjoy him, we fix our eyes upon his beauty and pursue that. But we must also ask the Lord to show us and help us to open our eyes. And so often our emotions run amok because we are not gazing on his beauty and we are not asking for his help. We're looking somewhere else and trusting in something else. Or we are not humble and teachable and willing to be taught. 
David's orienting his life around this one aim. So I'm not saying that you should not ask God for the job or the healed marriage or the changed relationship or the relief of pain. That's not what this text is saying. The point is David is expressing his preeminent desire and orientation of his entire life. That's why I asked the question the way I did, because it it reveals our preeminent desire. I'm asking you if you have ever asked God for more of himself, or if our prayers have been consistently consumed with all of the things he gives apart from being consumed with a longing for him. Right? Now, get the balance here. Please hear me on this. I'm not saying don't ask for, uh, for someone to get better or don't ask for the pain to go away or don't ask for the relief from financial hardship or don't ask for the salvation of your children. Or, I'm not saying that. I'm just asking, have you ever asked God for more of God? Have you ever, in all of your life, in all of your prayers, ever said, Lord, I want one thing from you right now, and that is to gaze upon your beauty and be taught by you and dwell in your presence forever. Is he merely dispensing good, and that's all that he's good for, or dealing with your problems? Is he a genie? Or is the aim and goal of your life the pursuit of your heart, which is him? And then if you have prayed that, do you actually pursue it? One thing I've asked of the Lord, and I will seek after. Have you oriented your life around that? Or has it just been one of those passive, oh, Lord, give me more of yourself, and then on with life as it is, lottie dottie. Do you see how this expresses the depth of his longing for God, the genuineness of his longing for God, that he not only asked, he not only asked God for it, but he says, I'm orienting my whole entire life around this. I'm pursuing it and I'm seeking it. His desire is to have an ongoing and increasing presence and fellowship of God in his life. The trajectory of our lives is due to the orientation of our hearts and the object of our highest affection is the rudder of the ship of your life and will determine your heading. It will determine what you pursue and what you seek after. In verse 5, we see David expressing trust in God, who is his desire. For, I, for he will hide me in his shelter on the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me upon the rock. He knows and trusts that in the day of trouble, God will hide him in the shelter of his presence and provision, and nothing can ultimately be, defeat him because he is treasuring and trusting. Do you see the trusting piece there in verse 5? Treasuring in verse 4, trusting in verse 5. He knows God is for those who trust in him. Another way to put it would be because of his confidence in God and desire for God, the trajectory of his life is different, and he knows he will not be disappointed. See, nothing else that promises us protection and provision and joy and satisfaction apart from God delivers, especially in the day of trouble. All other things and all other people will disappoint. In verse 10, he says, My father and my mother have forsaken me, but God will take me in. David knows the quality of his God, the character of his God, the power of his God, and therefore is utterly confident that God will come through on all of his promises and he will be preserved and he will be protected. He has learned that when all human support and comfort have failed him, God has not, and therefore he trusts in God for the unknown future. This is future tense here in verse 5. He trusts in God for the unknown future future. Do we have that kind of trust when turmoil hits our life? Do we have that reflexive, I will trust God because he is my shelter. He is my protection. He is my deliverance. He is my portion. He will always come through because I am him, his, and he is mine. And I don't know how or when he will do it, but I know he will 
Do we look back and see God's past faithfulness as a fuel for future trust in current trust in future grace? Final thing in verses 7 through the end of the chapter, seek God's face. Confidence in God, a desire for God, and then we seek the face of God. This kind of approach will cause us and lead us to diligently seek the face of God, to pursue God above all else. How much of our troubles and grief in life come from the fact that we are not truly seeking God? In other words, faith faith is expressed in very practical and ordinary ways of actually moving toward God, right? Because we kind of get this idea, like, uh, I, I believe, all right, God, now come to me. What does James say? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Because this is not passive. Right? You think about the thing that you love and long for the most, apart from God. Think of that earthly thing. Have you ever in your life been totally passive toward that thing and just said, come to me? You don't get married that way. Right? You're like, oh, that's the one I love. Oh, she's it. Still waiting. Why hasn't this happened? No, you actually, you move. The longing, the desire causes you to move toward the object. And hear me on this. So many Christians are passive. They've got spiritual atrophy. And their spiritual muscles are rotting. Because somehow, for some reason, we just expect, oh, I'll long for God and and I don't have to do anything. No. Pursuit. Action movement. Faith is expressed in moving toward God. And when we turn to him in faith and move toward him, he meets us. I love how psalmist puts it in Psalm 145, verses 14 to 20. The Lord upholds all who are falling and rises up, raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of the Lord look to you and you give them The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hands. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. And in this text, we see... We seek his face through worship and prayer. In worship, we see that in verse 6. He will worship. He will go and gather with God's people and offer sacrifice and song. But then in verses 7 through 14, we see some important points in this prayer that he prays that I think are really helpful to us. And we'll just... Bullet through these real quick. First one, and I want to linger for just a second on the last one. He calls out to God. So he begins in verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer to me. He calls and appeals to God for help. We cannot seek the Lord, and we cannot pray rightly without his help and his grace. We don't merely call out to him as a means of one-way communication, but we expect God to answer, communicate back as we listen to his word because he calls out with the truth of scripture. Verse eight, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face do I seek, O Lord. He quotes scripture and in essence tells God, you've told me this and now I'm doing it. David's mind and his heart was saturated with the word of God in such a way that it showed up in his prayers. He's seeking God with an obedient and trusting heart. He's trusting that what God says is true above God, all else. And he's like, he's basically, if God says seek him, that's good enough for me. 
I'm going to seek him. And when I seek him, I'm trusting, I'm doing what God has said, and therefore he won't forsake me and he'll honor it. Like, listen, especially when we're talking about emotions and, and having anti-fragile, resilient emotions, we are so tempted to say, yeah, but what about this? What about this? We need to recover the type of faith that says, God said it, good enough for me. I don't care if some psychologist says that this is ridiculous. I don't care if there's some study that shows this or that. I don't care if other people get better results, quote unquote, by doing something else. Faith is so simple at times. It's childlike, right? It's God says it, I'm going to do it. You've said to me, seek your face. So I'm seeking your face with my whole heart. I'm doing what you said, Lord. And I know that I'm not going to be disappointed in that. And then he expresses faith that God will not forsake him, though all others do. Everyone else may bail out on him. God will not. Verse 9, hide not your face from me. Turn not from your servant away in anger. For you who have been my help, O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation, for my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. When we seek God first, when we obey his word in faith, we will find that others that we thought might stand by us will bail and run. Don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you as though some strange thing has happened, right? Seek the Lord in obeying him can be a lonely road to walk. But here's the point. Even when all others abandon us, we don't walk alone. God will never leave us or forsake us. He is always with us. Then David asks God to teach him and lead him. And if we are to seek the Lord, then we are in need of instruction and guidance. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. If we are to seek the Lord, we are in need of his instruction and his guidance. We seek the Lord, in other words, by being taught by him and being led by him. He's given us his spirit inside of us to help us to understand and to lead us in paths of righteousness. The Lord is my shepherd, right? Psalm 23, I shall not want. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. One beats on you for going the wrong way, and one plucks you out of the danger when you stumble into it. Right? Be a good sheep, just be a really good sheep. Follow the shepherd. Be willing for him to lead you. Even though everything looks desolate around you, trust looks like just simply following in faith. I, I don't know where the heck we're going. I don't see any good grass, but I know the one who leads me. That's good enough for me. He's never failed me. He will always come through for me. Because he's my shepherd, right? And if that's true, the psalmist also asks God to keep him. If we seek the Lord, we need his protection because enemies are real. Spiritual opposition is real. So how do we keep by being swayed by the enemies of the Lord and the enemies of God's people, we need divine protection. Divine protection which God promises to his people, and so we appeal to God in whom we are confident, and we ask him to keep us. There's one more thing. I'm just going to linger here for a second. David expresses confidence through patiently waiting and looking forward to his future deliverance. We see that in the last two verses. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is perhaps the hardest part. But what we must see 
is that patiently waiting and looking forward to future deliverance is a necessary consequence that flows from the rest of this psalm. Say that again. Patiently waiting and looking forward to future deliverance is a necessary confidence from the rest of the psalm. It is the right and appropriate conclusion to everything that David has said thus far. I said before, David expressed trust in God. He basically said, I don't know how or why, but I, or I don't know how or when, but I know he will come through and not abandon me. Now, I want to take you through a few verses, and I just want you to notice a few things. In verse 1, he says, I will not be afraid. He is my light and my salvation. I will be confident because he is greater. In verse 3, he is my desire and pursuit in verse 4. And because of that, I know he will hide me in his shelter and protect me in verse 5. The Lord will not forsake me like others, but he will take me in in verse 10. He will teach me and preserve me from threats and violence of enemies in verses 11 to 12. And if all that's true, then the right response is to wait for the Lord in faith and look forward to that day because I believe I will see the goodness of God in this life. Though my adversaries and difficulties might seem to prevail, he will do what he has promised. Therefore, in verse 13, my heart will take courage and I will wait for the Lord. You see how that works? You see how that's the right place to land? Now, as you look back at the psalm, notice the use of singular first-person pronouns, me, my, I, right? He is my light, my salvation, my stronghold, I will be confident that the enemy encamp around me. One thing I desire and I seek after, I will gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I may dwell in his presence. He will hide me. He will conceal me. He will lift me. And I will sing and make melody to the Lord. I seek your face. Don't hide your face from me. Don't forsake me. The Lord will take me in, teach me, preserve me. And I believe that I shall see God's goodness. See, far from being some abstract, impersonal God, David rightly sees himself in relation to God personally. It is not some abstract, impersonal, academic theology divorced from existence, but real, personal conviction. Paul Tripp said, and I'm paraphrasing this, you can hold to abstract theology and still be searching for something to give you awe. Abstract theology is of no practical use. Theology properly understood doesn't just define God, but redefines me in relation to God. You can affirm that God is light without him being your light. You can affirm that God is salvation without him being your salvation. And if you do that, you will get impatient and you will look for some salvation and some light somewhere else to deliver you. And Christ came and died that by grace through faith, God would relate to us and deliver us as all of the glories of who he is being for us and being ours. Everything God is for us by his grace. And that should leave us with a profound sense of wonder and awe. But more than that, it should change how we live in light of that. And if these things are personally true, then we will confidently wait and look forward to future deliverance because where else can we go and in whom else can we trust? Who can provide for me, what I most deeply long and need for, or am in need of. And if we're trusting Christ by grace through faith, then grace has been poured out on us, and he is all of these things for you. 
Not just all of those things in general. All of them for you. That's the only way you can wait patiently with a courageous heart and look forward to the day when he will deliver you. That's the foundation for anti-fragile, emotionally healthy lives as Christians. I'll close with this. Nick DeToro has been sending me different verses every day at like 6 a.m. And I'm very thankful for that. Though I wish, Nick, if you're listening, you would go just an hour later. Um, I can't express how much of an encouragement this has been. But let me read to you one that he sent this week. He sent Isaiah 41.10, and I'm going to read through verse 13. So if you're trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, hear this. This is the word of the Lord. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend for you or contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Do you believe that? Let's pray.